In third generation form, Fiat's Panda aims at being all the cars some buyers will ever need. It's larger where it matters, yet still small enough for its urban purpose. It's efficient, yet can offer surprising reserves of performance, and you can make it high-tech, or specify one that's super affordable. The Italians have always done this kind of thing very well. They still do. What do you think has been the most influential, the most important automotive design since the turn of the century? A sports car, perhaps, or a, an MPV or SUV. Certainly something expensive. I reckon not. My personal pick would be this car, the humble Fiat Panda. This particular one is my sister's. I advised her to buy it eight years ago, and just like two million other customers who still pound global roads in this Mark II model, she's loved it ever since. And now wants to get her hands on its successor. This car, the third generation Panda, launched here in the spring of 2012. So what makes this model so extraordinary? Well, let me explain it like this. Almost every car you can think of can be pigeonholed into a specific market segment. And even if it can't be, it's likely to appeal to a very specific group of buyers. The Panda is different. Though priced and sized as a little city car, it's so versatile and classless that it can function as, well, almost anything you want. Depending on the flavour you choose, it's a design as suited to city living as it is to the needs of a mountaintop farmer. It can be a hot hatch or eco-conscious transport for friends of the earth. It can be a second car for older empty nesters or sole transport for a rural family. Less of a city car, more an essential car. It is, in the words of one top Fiat executive, the official car for doing whatever the hell you like. This is the Italian brand at its very best. This Mark II design dates back to 2003, but other small cars are only just getting round to matching its astonishing efficiency of space. And just as they do, along comes this Mark III design. Longer, wider, taller, more efficient, and in every way cleverer than before. Functional, solid, intelligent and free-spirited, it is still, we're told, a car that thinks outside the box. Let's try it. Shouldn't a car designed to think outside the box have an engine designed to do just the same? Fiat believes so, which is why the version of this car that your dealer is most likely to want you to drive is the one that I'm trying here, the innovative petrol twin air. It's a two-cylinder unit, a configuration that to my mind ought to generate about as much power as the average sit-on lawnmower. Yet here in this turbocharged model, it puts out 85 braked horses. That's enough if you rev the thing pretty hard uh, to see 60 blow by in around 11 seconds on the way to a maximum speed, pretty academic, of about 110 miles an hour, thanks to 145 Newton meters of torque. And it's that pulling power you really appreciate in the nip and tuck of city traffic. Peak torque arriving low in the rev range, thanks to clever twin air technology that allows the engine to breathe more easily. All of which means that you find yourself palming the high mounted gear lever around a lot less often than you might expect. There's even an engine note to suit the cheeky compact looks, a kind of putter putter sound that would seem to be perfect for nipping around the back streets of Naples, the city where this model is built. If you are urban bound and especially keen on cutting costs, there's the option of pushing this eco button just above the gear stick in the centre of the dash, which cuts the available torque by nearly 50% to 100 newton metres. Though it can be a little disconcerting if you forget that you've left the thing on and then dive for a gap in the traffic. I'd leave the thing alone if I were you. Uh, Probably a better option for townies would be a Fiat's Duologic gearbox, a kind of manual gearbox without a clutch, um, which is probably ideal if you were uh, a really urban bound, uh, unless you like all that left foot pumping, of course. For budget petrol people, Fiat also offers a 65 brake horsepower, normally aspirated version of this twin air engine. 
But it's a unit that, to my mind, doesn't really offer many advantages over the uh, 69 brake horsepower 1.2 litre petrol engine that this uh, Panda was first launched with. Now, uh, this is the kind of entry level engine that over 55% of UK Panda buyers choose. It may be an older engine, the 1.2. But it's a willing and it's a free revving unit that's quite adequately fast enough for most Panda buyers. Rest to 60 takes 14.2 seconds on the way to a top speed of 102 miles an hour. And it's also significantly quieter than the twin air alternatives, something that a number of buyers may prefer. To be honest, even the diesel Panda is quieter than a twin air. And the diesel in question being a 75 brake horsepower, 1.3 litre multi-jet um, that uh, on paper matches the twin air's frugality, but in practice probably betters it. Thanks to 190 Newton meters of torque, uh, rest to 60 takes 12.8 seconds on the way to 104 miles an hour, and it feels faster through the gears than the figures suggest. Aside from engines and performance, there's plenty else for previous Panda people to appreciate in this third generation design. For a start, there's much more of a big car feel to the way that it drives, thanks to uh, greater torsional stiffness, uh, suspension tweaks, and a wider track. So it turns into corners more sharply, rounding them with far less body roll, uh, uh, an experience aided by greater sensitivity from the electric power steering. It's more refined at cruising speeds on major routes too. In fact, Fiat says that it's uh, almost halved the noise in the cabin so that you can have a perfectly normal conversation with your front or rear seat passengers cruising at the legal limit. And that's something that makes you far more willing to take this car on longer journeys. As for the rest, well, as before, many of the underpinnings are shared with Fiat's other, more fashion-conscious city car offering, the 500, which is no bad thing, as that car's a pretty fun steer, especially in an urban environment. Somewhere this Panda is just as at home. True, the five-speed gearbox could be a bit more precise, but you'll appreciate the way that this third-generation model now takes even nastier small urban bumps in its stride. It gives you neat little touches, like the city button over here on the dash for the steering, which lightens everything up so that you can make full use at parking-type speeds of the tight 9.3-metre turning circle. Urban-friendly through and through, you see? There was something of a feeling of tiny MPV about the previous generation version of this Panda. There still is. It remains a tall car with a vertical tail, a five door only body shape and a large glass area. Bigger than before, slightly longer, taller and wider, but with the same wheelbase. So it occupies pretty much the same roadway footprint. As for the friendly new look, it's based on what Fiat designers call the squarical theme with rounded rectangles in vogue everywhere from the headlamps to the front air intake, from the wheel arches to that trademark extra third rearward side window. The squarical touches continue on inside. You'll find them on the instrument binnacle, the steering wheel boss, the ventilation controls on the center console, even on the seats where the embossed rounded squares are there to better help air circulate between your body and the backrest. The dashboard itself is enveloped in a colourful frame of your choosing, with a roomy storage pocket in front of the front seat passenger, supposed to evoke a nod to original 80s Panda motoring. Now that really was basic, uh, though for its time the Mark 1 Panda was undeniably clever, with seats that could be removed and washed, or kept and turned into a double bed. Now, I can't imagine anyone in a position to afford a modern Panda needing overnight accommodation inside, but uh, comfort will be a priority once at the wheel, where you sit high up in the kind of position you'd expect a miniature people carrier to provide, complete with the kind of all-round uh, visibility that even in this slightly bigger third-generation version makes the car very easy to place on the tightest city streets. There are a few issues. I could do without the rather unyielding hard plastic used on the, uh, the seat headrests. And as with many city cars, the uh, steering wheel adjusts only for height, not for reach, which is more of an issue where you have a really basic variant that, unlike this one, doesn't have height adjustment for the driver's seat. 
On the plus side, the high mounted uh, gear lever falls really nicely to hand. The buttons and the stalks function with a quality click and the mouse shaped handbrake lever is a lovely tactile touch. Overall then, a cabin of much higher quality than before. Far nicer indeed than you'd expect a car of this class and price to provide. Unlike Fiat 500s, Pandas are no longer Polish. The Tichy factory that assembled the old Mark II model now abandoned in favour of a state-of-the-art uh, Italian plant near Naples that on this evidence seems to screw the car together very well. Something you can admire as you scratch around to find uh, apparently up to 14 different storage compartments dotted around the cabin. Storage for bigger items is taken care of by a 225 litre boot that's significantly bigger than before, though still slightly smaller than a rival Volkswagen Up or its Seat or Skoda clones. Or at least it is if you don't opt for a feature that none of this car's main competitors can match, a sliding rear seat that can uh, be pushed forward and back by as much as 16 centimetres to enable you to prioritise room for either people or packages. Now with this sliding seat uh, pushed right forward, if you specified it, and I suggest you do, then potential luggage room can increase to as much as 260 litres. Plus there'll be a bit more under the boot floor if you haven't paid extra for a full size spare wheel. Now, if that's still not enough, then you can, of course, push forward the rear bench and, and flatten it. Uh, it's only split folding if you've opted for the sliding rear seat or a plusher trim level. And once you've pushed it forward, there's as much as 870 litres of fresh air here. That's uh, 36 litres more than the previous generation Panda could offer. That means you've got a two metre long loading length. And if that's uh, not enough, and you want to transport really long items, like a, a mountain bike with a wheel removed or a small surfboard, then you can talk to your dealership about uh, the further option of a fold-flat front passenger seat, which can give you uh, room for really lengthy items. As for rear passenger space, well, thanks to these slimmer seats, it's much better than before, perfectly adequate for a couple of fully-sized adults. If uh, this uh, front passenger seat has been specified as a fold flat option, then uh, one of the rear passengers could even stretch out chaise long style if there was no one alongside the driver up front. Initially, I was a bit irritated to find that the three person rear bench is an extra cost option until I looked around at most of this car's four seat only rivals where the five seat option isn't even available. Uh, yes, I know that you'd never transport three adults back here unless you were really desperate, but if, like me, you've regularly got three children to transport, then uh, being able to take three in the back is a really important feature. It's just another thing that uh, enables this Fiat to be a source of only transport, if need be, to families, something that's just not possible with many of its competitors. Now, you'll probably be paying somewhere in the nine to 13,000 pound bracket for your Panda once you've allowed for a few well-chosen extras. Think carefully about whether you really need to pay the 1,200 pound premium necessary to go from the uh, entry-level eight-valve 1.2 litre petrol model to the 85 brake horsepower turbo twin-air petrol variant that I've been testing here. There's an even bigger 2,200 pound premium to pay if you want to go from the base variant to a 1.3 litre diesel Panda. Most customers will probably be better sticking with the entry level model and spending any remaining funds on the options list. But whichever Panda you choose, you're looking at saving somewhere between uh, 1,000 and 1,500 pounds on an equivalent Fiat 500 with the same engine and two fewer doors. The added versatility of this car's five-door body shape will be a major selling point to most potential buyers, which is why here I'm not going to draw comparisons with three-door only city cars like the Ford Ka, the Renault Twingo or the Toyota iQ. They're all mostly pricier anyway. Instead, I'm going to limit comparisons to five major city car designs sold by a wide number of brands. Let's start with the newest kid on the block, the Volkswagen Up sold under different badges as the uh, Skoda Citigo and the Seat Mi. Now, all of these three rivals are on paper uh, slightly cheaper than this Fiat, but in practice with a bit of negotiation, I reckon you'd probably end up paying around about the same amount. 
So it then comes down to which suits your lifestyle better. I'm guessing that this Panda will probably have more widespread appeal. The other obvious alternative to consider is the familiar design that's variously known as either the Peugeot 107, the Citroen C1 or the Toyota Ego. Now available only with one litre petrol power, this particular design can really only compete with the entry level 1.2 litre petrol version of this Fiat. And in five door form, it's uh, more expensive, it's smaller and it lacks this Fiat's high tech equipment. Next up is the Korean contingent, by which I mean Hyundai's i10 and Kia's Picanto. They're basically the same underneath. Now, as you might expect from an Asian alternative, both can slightly undercut this Fiat on price. The i10 1.2 looking particularly good value against a Turbo Panda Twin Air. But uh, both really lack this Italian car's really clever touches. If you've considered all these rivals, then you've covered all of the main bases in the five-door city car sector. But for completeness, I also uh, ought to include mention of a couple of other alternatives. Relatively easy to dismiss is the Indian-built car that we know here as either the Suzuki Alto or the Nissan Pixo. This really does feel cheap compared to the Fiat, and only in the Nissan guise does it really offer any significant saving. Better is the design badged either as the Vauxhall Aguila or the Suzuki Splash, but it's slower than this Fiat in entry level form and way off this Panda's uh, pace when it comes to performance and emissions in, in terms of Pokia versions. Okay, so let's say you've been through the comparison process and decided that yes, you really are a Panda person. What can you expect to find included in the basic equipment tally? Regardless of your choice between 1.2 or twin air petrol engines or indeed the 1.3 litre multi-jet diesel. Well, all models get the basics, which in this case include a four speaker MP3 compatible CD stereo, electric front windows, central locking and a 12 volt power socket. Most though will want a mid-spec variant like the one I have here, a car that adds roof rails, a much improved and more effective air conditioning system and a nicer stereo. Whichever trim level you decide upon though, make sure that you also consider a few key options. First of all, there's the three person rear seat, which might well come in a bit more useful than you think. The same applies to the sliding rear bench via which you can prioritize space for either people or packages. I'd also want to consider the clever Microsoft developed Blue and Me infotainment system. Uh, through which you can connect in uh, MP3 music devices, uh, Bluetooth enabled smartphones, and there's also a USB port. Upgrading this to Blue and Me TomTom Tom 2 Live status will get you a 4.3 inch color touchscreen that slots easily here on top of the dash to give you satellite navigation with traffic updates. Through this, you can use Google Local Search and be advised of things like speed camera locations, points of interest, and the prevailing weather. As for safety, well, it's disappointing to find that ESP stability control is only available as an option, though when you do specify it, you also get a hill holder clutch as part of the package to stop you drifting backwards on uphill junctions. What is included in the standard tally uh, well, you can expect to find Isofix child seats fastenings, uh, anti-whiplash front head restraints and twin front and window airbags. Plus you can pay extra for side airbags if you want them. To try and make sure that you know how to use any of this stuff, there are the usual anti-lock brakes with electronic brake force distribution to make them more effective and brake assist to help in emergency stops. In addition, and unusually in this class of car, there's a kind of low speed collision mitigation system you'd normally only expect to find in more expensive market segments. Now, this uses a sensor mounted on the top of the windscreen to scan a space uh, a short distance in front of the car as you drive along. If an accident uh, collision uh, possibility is detected and the driver doesn't respond, then at speeds of under 18 miles an hour, the system can automatically activate emergency braking. And if you're going faster, then the system can at least slow the car down a bit so that the crash impact is minimized. Neat. Now you'd certainly expect this third generation Panda to be very close to the top of its class when it comes to running costs. 
that might be asking a little much for the entry level 8 valve 1.2 litre 69 brake horsepower petrol variant. This is, after all, one of Fiat's older units. Still, it manages 57.6 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and puts out 113 grams per kilometre of CO2, which isn't too far off the kinds of returns that you get from rivals with more modern engines. Um, where this Panda really scores, though, is if you opt for a, ver uh, a version with uh, twin air petrol power. Now, previously in this class, you had to pay stupid money for something with a diesel engine if you wanted a f uh, combined cycle fuel return up at around the 70 miles to the gallon mark, or if you wanted CO2 returns at close to the magic 100 grams per kilometre figure. No longer the 85 brake horsepower twin air, the turbo model that I'm driving here, runs on petrol, yet doesn't require a diesel premium to buy. Uh, yet despite its pokey performance, it manages 67.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and puts out just 99 grams per kilometre of CO2. Bear in mind though that to achieve these kinds of figures, you've to press this eco button on the dash, which substantially limits the engine's pulling power. And that for some might defeat the whole point of buying this twin air over the entry level 1.2 litre model in the first place. Those who really do want a diesel may be a little frustrated to find that the 1.3 litre multi-jet unit in question isn't the 95 brake horsepower engine offered in Fiat 500, but a slower yet still thirstier 75 brake horsepower version of the same design. Uh, it's uh, like the Turbo Twin Air, uh, returns 67.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle, but the CO2 return is higher at uh, 109 grams per kilometre. Both twin air and multi-jet buyers get a start-stop system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, when you're waiting at the lights or stuck in urban traffic. Um, ultimately though, the fuel and CO2 figures that you record are, are really going to be very much down to how you drive. And that's something that this Fiat can also help with, thanks to uh, what uh, the Italian brand calls its EcoDrive system. Now, the way that this works is that you uh, plug in a USB stick into the car, which then monitors your driving technique. You then take it out, plug it into your home computer, go to the EcoDrive website, and you can get all kinds of helpful advice then to improve the efficiency of uh, the way that you drive. What else? Uh, insurance groupings? Well, they range between 4 and 8 on the 1 to 50 grouping scale. Oh, and I can't leave this section without commenting on one final clever touch. It's here. There's no fuel filler cap, only a fuel filler pipe, which opens or closes automatically when the nozzle is inserted into it. It won't allow petrol to be pumped into a diesel car or vice versa. Neat. Loved by small car people the world over for more than 30 years, the Panda continues to define everything that a very compact, multi-purpose model should be. It's had to evolve, of course, with more efficient engines and clever technology, but its heart remains simple, functional and innovative. Which is why, while other city cars will please only city car folk, you can imagine this one being bought by, well, just about anyone. A few other rivals may be a little cheaper, more refined or slightly trendier, but few push the boundaries of design quite like this Fiat. It happily challenges just about every tiny car perception in the book. That you can't get really impressive fuel and CO2 figures without forking out loads of money for a diesel. That you can't seat five in this class of car, or carry really large items, or get big car high-tech features. Panda people think differently, thanks to a car that helps them do just that. It's got tough competition these days, no question. But in a growing segment full of talented offerings, it's a key contender you just can't help liking.